Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another lecture in Geography 341, Weather and Society. I'm Dr. Zach Hilgendorf, and in this lecture, we're going to take all of the stuff that we've been learning about, whether that be heat, moisture, energy in the atmosphere, all these different things, and start putting them to practice. Start to learn about how we understand and interpret different features or meteorological phenomena around us. And we're going to start with how clouds form and what drives that kind of cloud formation process. After that, we're going to break into looking at fog and major cloud types, and then we're going to end this little section here with looking at precipitation. So kind of understanding how that moisture that gets into the atmosphere then functions and acts and behaves within our atmosphere. So let's go ahead and dive on into it. So just as a quick recap, if we look at water in the atmosphere, we know that almost all the water in the atmosphere is contained directly within the troposphere where we live. Most of it comes in the form of water vapor, some in the form of cloud, water, or ice. And then typical mixing ratios, which if we recall a mixing ratio is just a unit mass of water uh, and a unit mass of dry air, around 10 to 20 grams per kilogram in the lower portions of the troposphere where we live. And then by the time you get to the mid troposphere, it's about one gram per kilogram. So you can see that the majority, the large majority of that water, that uh, kind of water vapor is condensed and held right along the surface or very low in the troposphere. Now, if we consider sources and sinks, where water and moisture are coming from and where they are going or what they're being driven or dropped into, uh, sources we can consider evaporation from the surface and evaporation of precipitation falling from above. So from the surface requires energy to supply latent heat of evaporation. That energy usually comes in the form of sunlight that thermal energy that heats the surface, uh, kind of overcoming the conduction, uh, or, or sorry, overcoming the, the cooler surface and heating it up, giving that latent energy and that latent heat and allowing that uh, liquid water to turn into water vapor. Uh, same thing for evaporation of precipitation. So precipitation is kind of that condensed form of liquid or a condensed form of, of water. And as it falls from above, latent heat supplied by cooling, the cooling effect of the air can kind of lead to that turning back into water vapor. Sinks include precipitation, so rain, snow, hail, etc. We'll talk about those a lot uh, in a couple videos from now. And then condensation at the surface and things like dew and frost. Now, if we recall from some of our previous videos, uh, just kind of our brief intro to clouds, they're just congregated atmospheric particles of water. Typical radius, somewhere around 10 millimeters uh, for part or per particle there, or particulate, pardon me, um, with liquid, solid, or a combination therein. So water droplets or ice crystals or some combo is really all clouds are. That picture on the left there, what we're seeing, that's just congregated atmospheric particulates of water. So there's some type of nucleus, there's some type of deposition that occurs on that nucleus, and then bing, bang, boom, we've got a cloud. And simply put, they form by condensation or deposition in the atmosphere. So some type of process where you have a liquid or a gaseous water going into a liquid water or a solid or a gaseous going into a solid form. Um, that water vapor somehow turning to a liquid or a gas by condensation or deposition. Now, to get condensation or deposition in the atmosphere, you need some type of nuclei, some type of small, tiny particulate for that water to condense onto. It can't just condense onto nothing. It just doesn't work like that. These are typically in the form of things like hygroscopic aerosols. Now, hygroscopic nuclei are water-seeking nuclei, basically, is what we can think of them as. Water vapor condenses onto hygroscopic surfaces readily, even when relative humidity is considerably lower than 100%. Salt is a great example of a hygroscopic particle. Now, that's opposed to hydrophobic, which are ones that repel water, that don't allow water to condense. The typical radius of a hygroscopic aerosol, in this case, is typically less than 0.1 millimeters. So if I have... I have a ruler here and I can zoom way, 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 way in. You're not gonna be able to see it, unfortunately, because of the uh, it's zooming on my face, but we're talking something so incredibly small, you know, the head of a pin, for example. If we look at the average raindrop size, roughly around two millimeters, to the average cloud droplet size, roughly around 0.02 millimeters, 
And then we consider the average condensation nucleus size, about 0 0.0002 millimeters, we can get an idea of just how incredibly small that feature is. So cloud condensation nuclei, basically aerosols for the most part. Aerosols can become cloud or condensation nuclei and condensation nuclei can become cloud con condensation nuclei. It's kind of, you can have, you know, a rectangle and a square, a square, a rectangle, that kind of thing. But here, not all condensation nuclei are cloud condensation nuclei. Why? Well, we'll get to that here in a second. So we typically see larger concentrations over land for these types of particles. Cloud droplets can form on both insoluble and soluble particles. And a particle that will serve as a cloud condensation nuclei is called hygroscopic and, or hydrophilic, as opposed to hydrophobic. Condensation may occur at relative humidity less than 100%, as I mentioned before. A particle that will not serve as a cloud condensation nuclei, but could technically serve as a condensation nuclei, would be something like a hydrophobic uh, nuclei or aerosol. Here, condensation may occur at RH greater than 100%. Cloud condensation nuclei sources may include things like dust, volcanoes, factory smoke, forest fires, and sea salt for good examples. So we know that condensation nuclei are hygroscopic or hydrophilic aerosols. We know their typical radius, and we need saturated air. It can be less than 100%, but typically you want or you you, you see this occurring in 100% uh, relative humidity or saturated condi conditions, more or less. So temperature has to be re reduced below a dew point. So you see we see our little graph there. We might have started out uh, on the right side of that trend line, that orange dot. We have to move to the left side, so we have that condensation. The two most common mechanisms for cooling, we've talked about these a little bit, things like contact cooling, so loss of heat to a surface that is colder than the overlying air. Uh, for example, following convection over a cooler surface or due to radiative cooling uh, of the surface at night. And then dynamic cooling or adiabatic lifting. We talked a lot about this in the last couple of videos. So adiabatic lifting is just that basically pressure differential that occurs when you have a your parcel of air rising through the atmosphere, that pressure lessens and you have kind of that cooling uh, of the air parcel as you move higher in the atmosphere. Requirements for deposition in the atmosphere, or, well, you need saturated air and a deposition or ice nuclei. So a little bit different than water. So things like this, you know, you need some type of nuclei to form uh, and start to freeze on and then you get kind of this crystalline lattice work that you see is a snowflake. Things like clay or kaolinite crystals serve as a really good uh, source of that type of deposition nuclei. So basically for either condensation or deposition you just need saturated air and some type of nuclei. If you want a cloud you just got to have both of those. So that was it. This is just a pretty simple video. So we talked about sources and sinks of atmospheric moisture, what are clouds and how do they form, and the requirements for condensation or deposition. Next, we're going to talk about fog, haze, dew, and frost. Some of the ground level stuff and mid-level stuff that uh, is more impacted by kind of processes at the surface. So that will really set up when we want to interpret clouds. So there you have it for this video, and we will see you in the next one. Thanks.